Hello and welcome to Let's Read Notes from Underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This is an audio presentation of the novella, with occasional clarifying commentary from me, the reader. Now, if you want to jump straight to the action, feel free to skip ahead to the next video in this playlist. To access the playlist itself, check out the video description below. Otherwise, stick around, and I'll explain the nature of this project a bit further, while providing some background material on the book. The basic purpose of this Let's Read is to make the literature as accessible as it can be in an audio format. Typically, when you read classical literature in print, you have a number of advantages at your disposal. An introduction from a literary scholar, notes containing background information that might be lost on a modern audience, time to absorb complications in the text, and so on. In a conventional audiobook, by contrast, you get simply the spoken text rolling on. But not here. With this project, I will read through the entirety of the book with you, but I will retain the license to add comments where I think it may be helpful to a general audience. In just a moment, I will provide some introductory background information on the novella. When completed, this Let's Read will also contain some concluding thoughts on the book, but it will also have some notes sprinkled throughout the reading, simply to clarify points that the average listener could easily miss. I will do my best to keep a light hand and to allow the text to stand on its own. But with a work like Notes from Underground, which is deeply immersed in the intellectual culture of 19th century Russia, there will be cases where it will be useful to identify references, and so you will be hearing my comments every so often to flesh out the full picture of Dostoevsky's work. I will reserve my own analysis and reactions to the text for the final video of this sequence. When I do have embedded comments in the text, they will virtually always appear at the end of a chapter in order to avoid breaking up the flow of the narrative. Sometimes, when the text has some detail that invites comment, I will indicate the fact that I have a note on that feature with the following sound. You can pursue that comment at the end of the chapter or not as you like. There will be other occasions where I will provide clarifying comments visually on the screen. For instance, where a particular expression in French requires a translation, or where one character is quoting the words of another in a way that is difficult to parse in audio format. In these cases, I will keep the text flowing, but clarification will be available to you if needed. Now, currently you are viewing this project as part of a YouTube playlist, and I will start making these videos available to the public once I'm about a third of the way through the recording. When completed, I will likely assemble all the parts of the playlist into a single video. If you prefer to listen in that format, the video description below may show you how to do so. Otherwise, feel free to stick around with this playlist. If you are keeping it here, our next item of business is an introduction to the novella itself. First off, Notes from Underground is in the public domain. The version we will be reading has been translated by Constance Garnett, and it appears in a Barnes & Noble Classics volume, which includes notes and an introduction by Deborah Martinson of Columbia University. I am indebted to both Martinson and Dostoevsky biographer Joseph Frank for my own comments in this project. In this format, the novella is about 110 pages long. This volume collects other works as well, including The Double, White Knights, The Meek One, and The Dream of a Ridiculous Man. This list of works is carefully selected. As Martinson notes, some have thought that these five disparate stories, written at different points of Dostoevsky's career, have enough thematic overlap that they almost compose a novel when placed together. But Notes from Underground is surely the highlight of that volume. 
Written in 1864, it is one of the most celebrated works that Dostoevsky ever wrote, and arguably it marks the beginning of the mature period of his career, where his genius was in full bloom. In fact, for those who have never read Dostoevsky, this is where I would encourage them to start, to get a taste for his style and depth of insight. But it is also an unusual book with a very strange structure. It is divided into two parts. The first, entitled Underground, relays the philosophical ravings of an unnamed middle-aged man who lives in isolation. In the second part, entitled Apropos of the Wet Snow, this same narrator recalls an episode of his young adulthood. There is only a rather loose thematic connection between the two parts, although both carry a dark tone, and each part is dominated by the peculiar psychology of the unnamed underground man. In fact, the overwhelming presence of the underground man threatens to obscure much of the novella's content. The structure of the book takes us to two different eras in Petersburg, and thus to two different intellectual milieus with which the narrator is grappling. The first part, we are invited to assume, takes place contemporarily with the time of publication, and the philosophical discussion within engages the radical ideas in circulation during the 1860s. But the events narrated in the second part are set in the late 1840s and criticize many of the themes that guided the literati at that time. So, while Notes from Underground carries a universal message for all of us, it was originally conceived as a polemic against particular opponents from the author's own lifetime. Indeed, one of these opponents might be his own prior time slice. Dostoevsky entered the literary scene in 1846 with his debut novel Poor Folk, blending the sentimental romanticism with which he grew up, as found in Schiller and Pushkin, with the social realism of the natural school, which attempted to depict the concrete situation of the poorer classes with an aim toward humanitarianism. By 1848 he was attending the meetings of the Petrushevsky Circle, whose members were enamored with utopian socialism. Petrushevsky himself had attempted to establish a phalanstery in the mold of Charles Fourier, and his associates dreamed of a world of universal beneficence founded upon socialist notions. Part two of Notes from Underground signals its intention to target this perspective on its first page. The very title, Apropos of the Wet Snow, is inspired by the observation of the literary critic Anenkov in 1849 that writers from the natural school employ the motif of wet snow in their depictions of the Petersburg setting. And the opening epigraph is a fragment of a poem by Nekrasov, which is written to a prostitute, whom the author had nobly redeemed from her debauched state. This is precisely the sort of action that would be lionized by the utopian socialists of the time, and it takes on deeper thematic relevance as the story develops. And so the spirit of the late 1840s is very much on the stage. But the most prominent target of Dostoevsky's polemic is a notable theorist and author of the early 1860s, an influential radical named Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Chernyshevsky preached a doctrine of rational egoism, according to which all people always serve their own perceived self-interest. But if those perceptions were to match reality, that is, if people were to recognize what was really in their self-interest, people would behave nobly and society would flourish. This doctrine naturally presupposes the predictability of human behavior and encourages us to harness the laws governing human psychology in order to produce better results. Of course, such steps would require major political reforms. While he worked predominantly as an essayist and editor, in 1863, 
while under arrest on political charges, Chernyshevsky published an enormously popular novel entitled What is to be Done, which exploits his ideas in fictional form. The novel describes events surrounding three principal characters, two men and one woman, who each subscribe to rational egoism and who each may be described as a man or woman of action. That is, unlike the romantic dreamers of the prior generation, they each take decisive steps to make the social reforms concrete. The heroine of the story develops a sewing cooperative which bucks the standard capitalist model and lifts other young women out of poverty. The two men, each of whom is a doctor, perform various heroic deeds and fearlessly violate old-fashioned social norms, refusing to bow before their presumed betters of the Russian class structure. Chernyshevsky's novel also has a clearly utopian flavor. The thematic development of the book is centralized in four quasi-prophetic dreams of the heroine. The final one reads almost like a secularized version of the heaven of John's apocalypse. Humanity's final perfected state is symbolized by a grand crystal palace with all the trappings of agrarian and technological perfection, with peace and harmony reigning everywhere. This is the paradise on earth toward which Chernyshevsky is pointing, a future which is entirely realizable if we simply imitate the fearless actions of the heroes of his novel. In Notes from Underground, Dostoevsky could not be clearer in his intention to respond to Chernyshevsky. The opening treatise of the underground man is wrestling directly with his views, and the second part indirectly lampoons two minor episodes of his novel. Even the style of writing might be interpreted as a spoof of his opponent. Chernyshevsky employs the brazen strategy of using his authorial voice to lecture and berate his readers. Similarly, Dostoevsky's underground man is frequently addressing his presumed reader in an adversarial tone, doing his best to refute caustic objections that he imagines being hurled his way. But why should Dostoevsky be so keen on taking aim at Chernyshevsky's novel? To understand that, we need a picture of key developments of Dostoevsky's journey since his naive utopian socialist days of the late 1840s. Dostoevsky's involvement with the Petrushevsky Circle led to his arrest in 1849. He would spend ten years in Siberian exile, four of them in a prison camp. Soon after his return to Petersburg, he would publish his semi-autobiographical memoirs of the experience in The House of the Dead, which, among other things, offers fascinating glimpses into human nature. Some of the most prominent developments of that book expose man's irrational instincts, where convicts would pursue clearly self-destructive behavior, all out of a desire for the illusion of control or dignity. In several passages, he reveals surprising moments of kind behavior that he thinks can only be interpreted as altruistic. And thus he takes issue with both elements of the expression rational egoism. In 1862, Dostoevsky took his first journey through Western Europe, reaching as far as London and the real Crystal Palace, then the site of the World's Fair. A few months later, he would pen Winter Notes on Summer Impressions, a social and political reflection on his observations abroad. Winter Notes anticipates Notes from Underground in both style and substance. The narrator of that work, like the underground man, takes up a conversational and sometimes ironic tone with his readers. Further, like the underground man, he is often critical of the moral fabric of the West, and at no point is this criticism more harsh than when dealing with the Crystal Palace in London. 
The chapter dedicated to London is entitled Baal, after the false gods of the Hebrew Bible. London, with its immense industrial muscle, was to Dostoevsky a bonfire of materialistic avarice, which fed on the souls of the hapless proletariat for fuel. At every stratum of this society, he insisted, people lived only for sensual pleasure, with an absence of genuine human feeling. The symbolic center of it all was the Crystal Palace, a mammoth museum to scientific progress to which people all over the world would flock and worship as if to some consummate ideal. Dostoevsky himself confessed to being awed at first by the structure, but also expressed a sense of spiritual urgency to recoil from it in the following passage. Quote, this is some sort of biblical illustration, some prophecy of the apocalypse fulfilled before your eyes. You feel that one must have perpetual spiritual resistance and negation so as not to surrender, not to submit to the impression, not to bow before the fact and deify Baal, that is, not to accept the existing as one's ideal. Unquote. For Dostoevsky, the Crystal Palace is not the heaven of John's apocalypse, but the evil beast prophesied within. In 1863, Dostoevsky had an unhappy, tumultuous affair with a younger woman. In April of 1864, he guiltily watched his wife wither away and die of tuberculosis. Letters to his brother reveal his state of mind at the time, including his reflections on immortality. The soul must be immortal, he reasons, because the proper purpose of a human being is to love others as himself, to lay down his own ego in the self-sacrificial embrace of the other. But this project cannot be completed on earth. It therefore requires immortality, or else our struggle to complete it would be meaningless. These, then, are the convictions of the Dostoevsky of the time. First, a recognition of the irrational nature of human beings caused by the urge of the ego to defend its dignity. Second, a belief in the ultimate duty to lay down one's own ego in an embrace of the other. Third, the observation that just such acts are in fact possible. And fourth, the belief that all of this requires some eternal dimension, as opposed to some cheap substitute of earthly contrivance. Chernyshevsky's novel opposed these convictions at every step. Dostoevsky, an inveterate literary brawler, was not going to take it lying down. Notes from Underground was his inevitable response. Such, at any rate, is the background of the novella. But its themes reach much further than a particular dispute with his rival. And for 21st century readers, the center of attention is surely the hypnotic revolt of the perverse psyche of the underground man against society. But our narrator does not need me to introduce him. He is perfectly capable of doing that himself, and he will do so next, as we begin Notes from Underground.